Model steam engines top tip time. This is part 8. I've been making tutorial videos like this for quite a while and as I make this one I think the total is somewhere in the region of two and a half thousand videos. From time to time when I'm making these videos I will put the top tip time logo in when there is something on screen that is especially useful. It occurred to me that there are many more top tips than I feature. For instance this old beam engine needed quite a lot of attention. It looks okay in this image but it really isn't. And during the restoration of this old engine there are quite a few top tips that are not always obvious. The way the top cylinder cover is bolted to the cylinder is not good. Here's the top cylinder cover before I machined it and you can clearly see the slope on it is a real problem with the bolts. Now it looks like this. I couldn't machine around the edges, I just had to use some emery cloth because it was exactly the size of the cylinder as it was. This is a much better arrangement, it's more like the full size and once the centre part is painted green it should look very nice. Definitely worth the extra effort I think. Now it's time to sort out the Watts Parallel Motion. What is Watts Parallel Motion? It's a simple yet very clever arrangement of link rods which allow the piston rod to just go up and down without being influenced by the beam which is describing an arc. Using a couple of pieces of 3 16 diameter steel I'm checking which are the best pairs to fit together. Bearing in mind that the oil holes need to be at the top if possible. Only a couple of these links were actually worn so I used them to fasten onto the front part rather than have them fastened to the beam. It's time now to make a new phosphor bronze bush for the block at the top of the piston rod and I found some phosphor bronze but unfortunately it was square and this is one of the reasons that I use three lathes. My Smart and Brown lathe is fitted with a very large self-centering four jaw chuck. I fitted this square piece of phosphor bronze into that chuck first and turned part of it so it was round then I could fit it into the three jaw chuck of my Boxford lathe to complete the operation. In this clip you can really see how differently phosphor bronze turns to brass. The chippings come off in one continuous piece. I could have completed this operation in the Smart and Brown lathe. I didn't do this for two reasons. One is the Smart and Brown tool room lathe that I have is really big and not normally found in a model engineer's workshop. In this clip I'm taking the final cut. This piece of phosphor bronze will now be an interference fit in the quarter of an inch diameter hole in the steel block on top of the piston rod. It's not going to be much good without a hole through the centre, so first of all I centre drill it to make sure the hole's in the middle. And here I'm drilling it using the imperial drill which is one size less than 3 16 of an inch. When drilling phosphor bronze it really needs a lubricant. By the lathe I have an aerosol can which contains cutting lubricant. And in the previous clip I squirted some of this at the phosphor bronze which now makes it much easier to drill. This next part of the operation is sort of an intermission. Whenever metal is hot, particularly phosphor bronze, it expands considerably. A lot of beginners, including myself when I first started, find it difficult to machine components to the correct tolerances, particularly if you do not use coolant. Before the next part of the operation, it's time to have an intermission. Sometimes you need to let the parts cool. Once it was cold, I ran the lathe in back gear and fed in a reamer. This is a 3 16 of an inch diameter reamer and it cuts a perfect 3 16 of an inch diameter hole in the centre of the piece. The hole size will be more accurate if you ream at a lower speed. To part off the finished bush, I'm running the lathe at normal speed without the back gear in place. The bush soon falls off into the chip tray. There is a way of stopping this by putting a shaft down the centre but I wasn't too bothered because my chip tray is currently very clean. I left the bush in the chip tray for a while till it cooled because parting off generally makes things very warm. Once it was cool enough to touch, I picked up the bush, fitted it back in the chuck and faced the front of it. Then it was over to the workbench to tap the bush into position using a soft hammer. A press would be much better to do this job, or even maybe the bench vise, but the soft hammer does the trick. After cleaning up the part on a piece of wet or dry sandpaper, it's time to find out whether it's the right size. Don't forget that the bush is an interference fit in the block at the top of the piston rod, so as you press it into place or hammer it into place, the hole gets smaller. It's very important to run a reamer through 
to make sure that the pin isn't a tight fit in there. And I'm pleased to say the fit of the pin and the bush is really good. This is something that's worth remembering. You can't remove the steam chest on one of this type of Stuart beam engines with the cross shaft in position. You can remove it if you undo the left hand gun metal bearing, which allows the cross shaft to be slid out of the right hand side bearing, but I need the entire mechanism removing, because it needs some work. Here's a close up shot with the mechanism out of the way, and as you can see, the port face is in quite good condition which is more than can be said for the valve. This middle part is supposed to be milled out to a certain depth, and like this it's a bit uneven and a bit shallow. I'll probably do something about that. This part of the system is not good. The operating arm on the shaft wobbles about, because the bolt that originally held it in position had sheared off. To drill out this very small broken bolt, I'm using my very small drilling machine. This is a Proxon motor tool drill press and it's a very useful thing to have in the workshop for very fine drilling operations. I do like a belt and braces approach to the job, so once I drilled out the broken bolt, I refitted the arm to the shaft using some Loctite 603. And then I used a taper reamer to ream just about all the way through, then I could fit a taper pin. The reason that I started the reamer through the smaller of the two holes in this part was because at the other side, where I drilled out the bolt, the hole was not in the right position anyway. This clip shows a taper pin that I fitted into the hole. And as you can see, where it came through the centre of the rod, it wasn't in the right position, in the hole where the bolt had sheared off. This doesn't look too good, but I have a fix for this. It's called a hammer. I riveted over the taper pin to fill this hole. This next clip shows the result. After riveting, I cleaned up the part using my 1 inch belt sander and now it looks like this. Not perfect, but a lot better than it was. And with a combination of Loctite, a taper pin, and then riveting over the taper pin, means that this arm is never going to move on this shaft again. That concludes this episode. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.